would to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, where we were last week on Wednesday evening, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Our text tonight will be found in verses 11 through 20 of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I'd like to begin reading in verse number 10, however, because that's really the pivot on which this entire chapter turns, and especially the phrase, wisdom is profitable to direct. And so we want to begin reading in verse number 10, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and this evening we'd like to finish this chapter and speak about the second part of this thought that wisdom is profitable. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 10, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him who can tell him. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Now, as we pointed out to you last week, chapter 10 is a description of the value of wisdom. When wisdom is consistently and properly applied to one's life, you will find that there is great benefit, there is great value to that person. And certainly throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, we've seen that there are lesser pursuits which the wise man has checked out and has decided those things are not worth living for. He's now, by the time we come to chapter 10, he's come to the conclusion that wisdom is a better way. Wisdom is the right way to live, and he is driving home that point to us here in chapter 10. Many of the statements in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 sound very similar to something that we would read in the book of Proverbs. And certainly he is directing our minds towards wisdom and the value of of wisdom. Now, in verses 11 through 20, we find two distinct areas that he speaks about the need for wisdom. In the first several verses of this section, he talks about how we need wisdom in our words. And we'll notice as we study these verses that your words are an indicator of what is in your heart. And it's really an indicator when you listen to how someone talks you learn something about whether they are wise or foolish. The second section, the second part here that we'll deal with, is how we need wisdom in our leaders. And we'll talk about why that is and how these two things go together. So notice in verse 11, first of all, we need wisdom in our words. Now he says something very curious in verse 11. It's clearly in the context of the right kind of words. And he says, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and the babbler is no better. Now, I don't know if you have an image in your mind of perhaps something that you've seen on television where a snake charmer is mesmerizing a, a cobra in front of them and the snake comes out of the bag as they play some kind of an instrument and have the snake under their control. Now, I'm not wild about venomous snakes to begin with, but you would not find me sitting in front of a cobra playing a flute for sure. 
I would be trying to get out of there. But what is the point here when he's speaking about a serpent that is not enchanted? Well, he's clearly teaching in verse number 11 in regards to us needing wisdom in our words that there is something very dangerous about a person who is a babbler. He's comparing a babbler to a snake that is out of control. I don't know how I stumbled across it, but I found one of these channels on YouTube where this guy in Australia goes and catches the most venomous snakes in the world in people's houses. And he gets them under control and gets them in a bag and removes them. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Australia, it's illegal to kill any sort of anything Even if it's the most venomous snake in the world in your house, you have to call someone to come and remove it safely and relocate it to a better place to live. And so this guy comes in and he gets these snakes under control. They're very aggressive, very venomous. He gets them under control and gets them in his bag and, and takes them away. So think about a serpent that is out of control. Think about what that is like and what that would mean to you. For instance, if you... Uh, had some kind of an inkling tonight that when you go home, there is a venomous snake that's crawling around somewhere in your house. Are you going to sleep peacefully tonight? Probably not. Probably not. So he says, this serpent without enchantment is a very dangerous creature. And notice that he's comparing it to someone who is babbling. What is a babbler? He says the babbler is no better. The word babble means to run at the mouth. It's someone who is just overflowing with words. They're always talking. They're always saying something. They're always, they always have some comment to offer. Now notice this. When words are multiplied, there is abundant reason for us to be concerned about sinning with our words. Be careful, because in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, to quote one of the Proverbs. When you and I are tempted to fill the silence with words, we should be reminded of how easy it is to sin with our tongue. And so he warns us that it's very dangerous to be around a babbler, and it's very dangerous to be a babbler Yourself, Put a watch on your lips and ask the Lord to help you with that and watch out for the babbler. Now you'll notice in verse 12, the only positive statement that he makes in regards to our speech is found in the first part of verse 12. All of the other statements in this section are negative, which is indicative, I believe, of how easy it is to sin with our tongue. But he says something very interesting in verse number 12. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. And so this is the value of gracious words. Gracious words are valuable. They are helpful. We find in the scriptures that the right kind of words are very powerful. They can build relationships. They can encourage another person. They can communicate truth. Words in the mouth of a spirit-filled person can be put to work to do the bidding of God. And so we ought to be careful that our words are gracious. Now, the word gracious is very specific because it speaks not only about the form of our words, the kind of words that we use, but it also speaks about the kind of spirit that we have when we use our words, gracious words. The word grace or, or graciousness refers to the fact that we are benevolent towards other people even when they may not deserve for us to be benevolent towards them. Sometimes we think that it would be best to give people a piece of our mind or to really give them a telling off and let them know what they've done wrong and what we think about them. But that is rarely the case. Actually, the truth is that we are much better off to use gracious words, kind words, words that are, uh, that are forgiving, words that overlook the faults of other people. When we think about gracious words, I think we all know what gracious words are, and we all appreciate when gracious words are spoken to us, 
But don't we find that gracious words are hard to come by? Especially when our spirit is aroused, when we are upset about something, when we are trying to get our way or try to get things to go a certain direction, we are prone not to use gracious words. But gracious words are very powerful. You should do a study sometime about the kind of words that are most effective. And you'll find that many times this word grace or gracious is applied to our words in a powerful sort of way. If you would learn to speak with gracious words, you would find that God would bless the things that you say. But you'll notice that the contrast in verse 12 to the gracious words are the lips of a fool. Now, the rest of the section is going to talk about the lips of a fool, and you'll notice that the lips of a fool here are characterized as swallowing up himself. That's quite a word picture, isn't it? When I was studying this verse, I thought, I'm thinking right now about a big set of lips, and this person is just going into his own lips and closing around him. It's the idea of he's, he's eating himself up. Now, what are the words of a fool? Well, a fool's words, because of his character of foolishness, are also full of foolishness. And that's borne out in the context we'll see in just a moment. A fool doesn't speak with foolishness in order to harm himself. Actually, generally speaking, people speak in this way because they think they're protecting themselves. They think they're helping themselves. They think they're furthering their cause. They think that they're building themselves up. They think they're going to get their way, that things are going to go their direction. But what they don't realize is their foolish words are actually hurting them. Their, their own foolish words are being directed against themselves. You know, the sad thing is, a lot of people have this idea that they can use words to cut down other people, and they don't realize that when they're cutting down this other person, they're actually damaging themselves. The words of a fool are damaging not only to the people around them, but also to themselves, and they end up swallowing themselves up with their ungracious words. And that is the contrast that is here. It's obvious that the way that a fool speaks is the opposite of gracious words. He does not use gracious words, and this is an alert to us that he is a fool. Now, what's interesting is that a fool is marked and known by his speech. If you listen to a fool, then you'll know that he's a fool simply by the kinds of words that he uses. He'll be someone who speaks in the wrong sort of way. You ought to learn how to pay attention to what people say, and you'll learn something about their character. For instance, someone whose mouth is full of profanity is telling you that their heart is profane. Someone whose mouth is full of lying is telling you that their heart is full of deceit. Someone whose mouth is full of bragging is telling you that their heart is full of pride. Someone whose mouth is full of dirtiness, the Bible uses the word jesting to speak about filthy jokes in the New Testament, is telling you that their heart is full of lust. And on and on we go. The heart's condition is revealed by the words that come out of a person's mouth. And a fool is damaging himself by the things that he is saying. Now, the thought continues into verse 13, and he says this, "...the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness." He goes from foolishness to mischievous madness. Now, let's think about this for just a moment, what this means in verse 13. When a person's words begin with foolishness, what is foolishness? Well, in the Bible, it's more than just silliness or words of no consequence, although that certainly pertains here. But the idea of foolishness is that which is contrary to God's truth, that which is opposed to God's wisdom. 
And the fool starts talking, and he's, he's got the words just spilling out of his mouth, and, and like it says there, he's a babbler. The words are just coming out, and he's not paying any attention to what he's saying. He's just spilling out all of these words, and he's got all of these foolish things to say, things that are of no consequence, that are just filled to the brim with nonsense and contrary to the truth of God. When a person starts talking this way, watch out. Because that's where it starts, but that is rarely where it ends. You pay attention to what happens. You get some young people together and some foolish talk starts. It won't be long till that foolishness has moved to mischievous madness. Till they are starting to say things that are going to get them in a lot of trouble. It might start out with just a little bit of silliness, some frivolity, some looseness in their talk, and it quickly devolves into something else. He warns us that foolish talk leads to mischievous madness. I think so many times when people are not carefully considering their words, the words that come out of their mouth could be characterized as foolishness. Just silly and empty and worthless. You know, when you open your mouth to speak, you ought to make sure that something of consequence comes out. You say, what is something of consequence? Well, you could compare it to that which is true, that which is honest, that which is just, that which is pure, that which is lovely, that which is of good report, that which has virtue, and that which has praise. Philippians 4.8. And you would find, if you followed that, that your speech would be excellent, and it would be far away from the foolish speech that leads to mischievous madness. But sadly, we don't come programmed from the womb to think or speak in this way. And so all of us are familiar with this type of foolish speech that comes so naturally to us that so easily spills out of our mouth, especially when we're not controlled by the Spirit of God. So when your mouth is filled with foolishness, the end of your talk will be mischievous madness. And that's quite a descriptive phrase to describe mischief or mischievousness is perversity. It's taking the truth of God and twisting it. And madness is insanity. And think about this. When people twist the truth of God and they begin to talk in such a way that they are defying what God has said, they are actually practicing insanity. Spiritual insanity. Why? Because they are defying the truth of God and describing that their path is going to work out fine and God is not, is not speaking the truth, and the result of that, as we all know, is going to be destruction because they are setting themselves against the very Creator. They're saying that they know better than God Himself. When people start talking with foolishness, it always ends up in mischievous madness. You say... How would you know what this kind of talk sounds like? Well, I haven't watched any sitcoms in a long, long time. But I've seen enough clips of what is on those sitcoms to tell you that that is probably a good description of this kind of speaking. The kind of filthy humor that the world values and finds funny but is directly opposed to what God says is truth. And if you're filling your mind with that kind of nonsense, then you'll find very soon that your speech is affected and your behavior is affected and you'll quickly devolve into mischievous madness. Be careful what you fill your mind with because it has an effect on your direction of life. This fool is speaking in a way that is contrary to God's wisdom, that leads him to twisting up the truth of God, 
And I believe that verse 13 characterizes so much of our popular culture in one simple proverb. But verse 14 continues the thought. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him who can tell him. Now we've already pointed out the babbler in this section and we've been warned about the babbler and the overflow of words, but this is a special kind of overflow of words. The fool is full of words. He's always running at the mouth. He's always saying things that he's going to regret. Words are spilling out without any control. He just gets started and his mouth gets running ahead of his brain. And next thing he knows, he's bragging about things. Talking about how he's going to do this and how he's going to do that. And when necessary, he fills in the details with as many lies as he needs to be convincing. He talks about what he's going to do, where he's going to go, and how important he thinks he is. But sadly, as verse 14 tells us, no one really knows what is going to happen tomorrow. In fact, in the book of James, we're warned that we should be very careful about saying that we're going to do such and such a thing tomorrow because there's not a one of us that knows what's going to happen tomorrow. It would be better for us to say, if the Lord will, I will do this tomorrow. If the Lord wills, I will do that tomorrow because our tomorrow is outside of our control. But see, the fool, he doesn't think about God. God is not in all his thoughts. He's just thinking about himself and all of his plans and the things that he intends to do. And mostly, he's trying to impress the people around him by bragging about all the things that he's going to do and accomplish and how important he is. And what's even worse is, most of the time, a fool who talks about all the things he's going to do doesn't intend to do anything at all. Because he's got another big problem besides the fact that he can't control tomorrow. He's rarely, the fool is rarely a person of action. And this point is brought out in verse number 15. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Now, it's curious phrasing in verse 15, and there's some disagreement about exactly what verse 15 is talking about, but if we take it in context and we look at it in this context of the words that spill out of a fool's mouth, I want you to understand this truth tonight, that talk is cheap. And I believe that's what verse 15 is saying. Talk is cheap. A foolish man is marked by talking about all of the things that he's going to do. He thinks so highly of himself, of his intelligence and his abilities and, and his talents, and he thinks that he's God's gift to the world. In fact, usually the fool, this man, he can't figure out why he's not getting paid twice or three times what he's getting paid at work because he certainly is worth that much, and the stupid people who make more than him and who make the decisions about the pay, I mean, they just don't know what they've got when they've got him. But he's got a big problem because he's only big in his own mind. Do you notice what it says in verse 15? When it comes time to work, the fool gets tired right away. It's a lot easier to talk about what he's going to do than it is to actually do it. It's much easier to brag about all the things he's going to accomplish and to tout his good qualities and tell everybody how wonderful he is. But when it comes time to work, you look around. What happened to him? Where'd he go? I thought, I thought he was going to be here helping. I thought he was going to be contributing to the project. He told me how many talents he has and all of a sudden he's off getting a coffee again. You see, foolish people are easily wearied by real work. They spend all their time talking and little time doing. When it says, he knoweth not how to go to the city, the city is the place where business is transacted. 
The city is the place where transactions take place. You go to the city and sit in the gate, and that's where deals are made and, and business is accomplished. He doesn't have the foggiest notion how to do this because he's never done any of it. He just knows how to talk about it. And when it comes right down to it, when the rubber meets the road, the foolish man is full of talk and empty of labor. Why? Because he's a fool. That's why. And he'll find out the hard way that his way doesn't work out. Now, there's another verse that deals with our words and how we need wisdom in our words, and it's all the way at the end of the chapter in verse number 20. You've probably heard the phrase before, how did you know that? Oh, a little bird told me. Probably came from verse 20 of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. He says, curse not the king... No, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. What is the lesson of verse 20? We need wisdom to be careful what we say. Be careful what you say. Now, just in short, you ought to make it a practice not to say anything unless you want it repeated. You say, well, I said it in confidence. I told that person a secret. I I didn't want anybody to pass it on. Then you shouldn't have said it. If you didn't want it passed on, you shouldn't have said it at all because the chances are that as soon as it leaves your lips and hits the ears of another person, chances are high that it's going to be repeated. Even if you really trust the person that you're talking to, It may slip, it may be repeated, or somebody may be listening that you didn't know was listening. Somebody may be overhearing what you're saying. The idea of verse 20 is this, be careful what you say. We have a song that we teach our children sometimes. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful, little mouth, what you say. And you know, the truth is that even if no one is listening, God is listening. We ought to be so careful. In fact, in verse 20, he addresses something which we often don't think about. He said, be careful about your thought. Now, why would we need to be careful about our thought? Well... I don't think that the birds of the air are going to be able to read our thoughts and communicate that to someone else. But here's something that is very true that we all ought to be aware aware of. What we think about tends to come out of our mouth. Even if you know that you shouldn't say it, when you're thinking about it, it tends to come out of your mouth. So you ought to be really careful about what you give brain space to. Be careful about the things you think about. And if you're careful about the things you think about, then you won't have to be nearly as careful about the things that you say. Be careful about the words that you use. We need wisdom in our words. I think this is why in the book of James we're told that there's not a one of us that's perfect in our speech. If you want to be aware of how sinful you are, just start paying attention to your words It will humble you quickly as you realize how difficult it is to keep control of your tongue. And I think all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, would say, you know, I I guarantee that I have been guilty of foolish speech at times in my life. And as much as I don't ever want to give in to that again, I suspect that there will be times when I will fall in the area of speech and sin with foolish speech again. I might point out to you that once you realize that about yourself, you'll be a lot more gracious with other people and the kind of words that they use. Rather than being so hard on them, you might say, I can can identify with that. I can identify with that struggle. I can see that in my own life, that tendency, because this is a battle that we fight. We need some wisdom in our words. The second part of this section, though, he tells us that we need wisdom in our leaders. And the things that he's going to talk about in verses 16 through 19 apply to 
a couple of things. First of all, it applies to thinking about what kind of leaders would we want to have over us. And then it also applies to what kind of leaders ought we to be. If God has given us any any measure of authority in our life, in any part of our life, what kind of leader should we be? Uh, How should we practice in these things? And so these two things will be very helpful to us. Notice in verse 16, he says this, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Now, there's two things here. First of all, I'll point out to you that there is woe to the land when the king is a child. Now, why would that be? It would be because of this. Children act like children. Children do not have maturity, even though they like to think that they do. Every child thinks that they're big. They think that they're mature. They think that they're wise. But the truth is, children do childish things. But what's really bad is when someone who is a man has not put away childish things. When someone who has been given authority and is to rule over the people, and yet he has given himself to childishness. You see, what is being described in verse 16 is this sadness that comes when people in authority act like children, or a parallel thought, when things get flipped upside down in a society and children are the ones who are in charge. Children are the ones who are looked to. So think about first that thought about children being the ones in charge. Charge. You understand, and I hope, at least I hope you understand tonight, that children need governance and restraint. It's important. That's why God gives parents to children. And the parents are given the job of restraining their children. In fact, the Bible says that Eli sinned against God by not displeasing his sons. He was too afraid to confront his sons about sin in their life, and he ended up displeasing God because of that. If if you want to put it this way, He had centered his home around his sons and he allowed them to rule instead of taking the authority in his home. And I'll point out to you that his sons were adults, but I don't think that was something that started after they turned 18 or 19 years old. I think it was something that had been in his home for a long time. Now, it's a sad thing, but in our society, just in the last couple of generations... Everything has gotten flipped around in our culture to where in our culture it's normal for children to rule the roost. It is. Parents run around. What do you want? Honey, what do you want? What can we do to make you happy? Oh, whatever you want, we'll do that. Now, I'm not suggesting parents that we should go out of our way to displease our children or make them unhappy, but neither should we put them on the throne of our family and tell them that whatever they want is how it's going to be. As a parent, we have the uncomfortable job of displeasing our children and confronting them. Now, this can be true in a home, but just imagine this taking place in a nation where you have children in charge of everyone, and they, and they, are, they are making the rules, and they're, they're telling everyone this is how it's going to be. I don't know. It does seem like this is going on in our culture. It does seem like the people who are in authority are using their place, their position to please themselves. And they're, they're doing the things that they want and making themselves happy instead of serving the people that God has called them to rule over. Now think about this. Princes eating in the morning... That, the idea of verse 16, princes eating in the morning, it's not that it's a sin to eat breakfast, all right? So some of you who don't like breakfast, you could use this maybe as a a proof text, but that's not what it's talking about. The idea is that they're in a perpetual party. They're, They're partying all day long. 
They party at night. They party in the afternoon. They party in the morning. All day long, they're having a party. They're, they're doing the things that they enjoy, that please them, the things that make them happy. Instead of serving the people, instead of, instead of doing the things that they're supposed to do with the responsibility that they have, they're not taking their responsibility seriously. They're just indulging themselves and living in luxury and pleasure while the people suffer. And here's what God says, woe to the people. If you want a really, a really crazy example of this, you could look at the country of North Korea where you have the guy at the top, the ruler, who literally is living one of the most lavish lifestyles of like a playboy billionaire, while the people that he's supposed to be ruling over and serving are starving to death. And, and this is a wild, a wild contrast that ought not to be. But it's what happens in a society when we exalt lasciviousness and lust and pleasure and we make that the most important thing verse 17 is a contrast to this the blessing that comes to a land is when the king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness notice the emphasis here is that it's a blessing to a land when you have someone in authority who understands their position. The idea of them being the son of nobles is that they understand their position. They understand their authority and they act with nobility and self-restraint. They don't take advantage of their position to take advantage of other people. Instead, they serve others and they only eat what is needed instead of indulging themselves and giving themselves over to gluttony and drunkenness. This is the kind of leaders that we ought to pray for in our own country. These are the kind of people that you want to have in authority over you. And if you are in authority, this is the kind of leader that you ought to aspire to be. What kind of leadership is this? It's the servant leadership that Jesus exemplified with his own disciples. It's the idea of being the servant of those that you are called to lead, of, of giving of yourself and sacrificing of yourself to meet the needs of others, and you'll find that God blesses that. Now, verse 18, I believe, goes along with it. Verse 18 and verse 19. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. Have you ever seen a house that was falling down? How does that happen? Well, just a little bit at a time. Just a little bit of negligence. A couple shingles here. A piece of siding there. Some unpainted wood over here. A foundation that's not taken care of there. A door that doesn't properly seal in this place. This thing and that thing and all of this negligence. And what happens? It decays. It falls down. One thing that we've learned, or that I hope that we've learned, is that if there's anything that we have that is worth keeping, it must be maintained. This is true of so many different areas of life. But understand tonight that, that laziness is a terrible curse. And it results in a building falling into decay. It takes a lot of activity to keep a house in working order. And idleness will result in the dropping through of that house. Just think about a property of this size. God's blessed us as a church with this property, this building and the grounds. But just think about how much work it takes to maintain that, to keep things operating, to keep things working. There's all sorts of things that always have to be cleaned and, and taken care of. And, and boy, what an important thing. I, I think when we're in our... You know, with our family, We're, we try to teach our children, you know, the house doesn't keep itself clean. It'd be nice if it did. It'd be nice if we lived in one of those self-cleaning houses, but it just doesn't work that way. And sometimes we say, how did the house get so dirty? I don't know. While we were sleeping in the middle of the night, a tornado came through and messed everything up. No, we know how it got dirty. We know how it got that way. So what does it take? It takes diligence and effort but laziness and idleness says, well, I'll just, 
do it later. I'll get around to it some other time. I'm, I'm tired right now. I've got too many other things on my mind. Now think about all the applications to this important principle. This is true of a house. This is true of a family. Boy, there's so many things that have to be maintained in a family. Relationships and training our children and building strong relationships with our spouse and, and our children and investing in them. There's so much that's involved. How about in a church? It's necessary to invest much energy to have a church that is active and vibrant and, and, and is going in the direction that God wants us to go. It, it requires us to put our shoulder to the wheel and to be involved. If we take the attitude, well, I'll sit back here and watch while everybody else works, then something's going to be lacking. Something's going to be missing. How about in a business? Do businesses just run themselves, and all of a sudden, wow, look at this. I have this profitable business that's making all this money. It's wonderful. I just sit back here and do nothing, and the money comes in. No, it doesn't work that way. If you see a successful business, it's because there are some people who've learned to work hard, who've learned to be diligent, who've invested their time. How about a country? How is a country maintained? In the same exact way. And that's why... When we give ourselves over to pleasure and self-indulgence and laziness, everything falls apart in a short amount of time. It doesn't take long. He's warning us about this. He's giving us this insight into our lives to beware of slothfulness and idleness. Finally, verse 19, the most curious verse in the whole passage. A feast is made for laughter and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. All right, first of all, before I even talk about this, there are so many different ideas about what verse 19 means. Lots of disagreement about what it is talking about. I'm going to tell you what I think it's talking about. And I am interpreting it in the context of the rest of the passage. Because I believe it's a continuation of the thoughts from verses 16 through 18, speaking about our leaders, speaking about authority, speaking about what happens in a nation and how authority ought to be exercised. And I think verse 19 is sharing with us the twisted philosophy of a hedonist. What is a hedonist? It's someone who lives only for pleasure. They live only to get the things that make them happy. This seems to be describing these hedonistic and selfish rulers who act like children and only think of themselves. They love to feast. They love to be drunken. And they love the power that comes with having money. They think this is what life is all about. But we've already learned something in the book of Ecclesiastes, haven't we? And what we've learned is that pleasure is short-lived and money doesn't satisfy. You see, the wise man has already come to the conclusion that this is not what life is about. But the alarming thing is there's a lot of people around us who are still trying this path. And they think this is the way to be. They need to be convinced that this is not the right way to live. This is not even the path to real satisfaction or joy or happiness. Do you know this? If you only indulge yourself and you never learn to be disciplined and to control your impulses, you will never be happy. Never. You, you might catch little slivers of happiness here and there, but you will find that your hedonistic desires will eat you alive. That's why, actually, the path to satisfaction and contentment is found in the path of self-discipline, of learning to control our impulses, and ultimately, we know from the New Testament, to have them brought under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, notice... Once again, we need wisdom. Wisdom is profitable. If you live according to wisdom, it will make a difference in your life. It will be a blessing to you, and you will find that you will reap the dividends for all of eternity. But we need wisdom in our words, and we need wisdom in our leaders, and ultimately, we know where wisdom comes from, don't we? Wisdom is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of wisdom to us. Apart from him, 
We could never find true wisdom. We could never, never understand the divine wisdom that he's given to us in his written word. We desperately need Jesus to make sense of life. And tonight, if you're trying to make sense of life without Jesus, let me save you a lot of time. It's not going to work out. You might as well stop right now and decide, this is foolishness. This is a waste of my time. Let me get to Jesus and let him instruct me about what life is really all about. Because wisdom is profitable to direct. Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray that you'd bless our time of prayer now. Bless our fellowship as well. Help us, Lord, to honor you in our conversations. Lord, we need wisdom in our words tonight in the things that we say. Help us to be wise and not foolish. Help us, Lord, those of us who have places of authority, help us to be the kind of authority that we ought to be. Help us, Lord. I pray that you would give us these kind of leaders in our life, that we could live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in that way. Now be with us as we spend some time in prayer, and thank you for this chance that we've had to get together and fellowship around the Word of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.